if you've just been dropped into the type platform, uh, chances are you're actually not in this directory, uh, d depending on uh, if you've logged into type before and if you've navigated around. It. You might be dropped into this type content dash reference repository dash ref. Uh, if you're here, you can go to content. Uh, under that notebooks, you might also be dropped into this directory too. I think it depends, uh, but you'll go under content notebooks. This one is a uh, webinar series. That's what we're doing right now. And then there's two notebooks in here. Zero, zero, the cloud is the one that we did last time. We are on lesson one, which is light curve. So I'll open up this directory. There's two notebooks in here. One of them is light curves. One of them is light curves live. Uh, the light curves live version is what I'm going to be using. It does not have code in the code cells. I'm going to be live coding and, and typing along so that so everybody can see uh, see how I what the process is. If you want to follow along in code, uh, you can use the live version. If you want to see the code that I'm typing, so you can anticipate and, and sort of figure out where it is that I'm trying to go and better understand, that's fine too. If you're not going to code at all, and if you're in fact you're not even going to log into type, that's also fine. If you're just here to watch and, and you're along for the ride, you can do whatever works best for you. But I just wanted to make sure that the the options were clear. With that, I'm actually going to open up this live version of the notebook, and we will get started. And very quickly, if you are logged in, I'll point this out. It should say test environment in the upper right. If you see Python three, uh, don't. That's not the that's not the kernel you want. Uh, test environment is the one that you want. It has all the packages installed that we need to to run this. So do do make sure that that is the environment that you're in. All right, lesson one, time series data and exoplanets. So in this lesson, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about how missions like Tess and Kepler uh, look for repeated changes in brightness to detect planets. We're going to actually plot a light curve using some mission generated LC and TPF light curve and target pixel file files uh, from the test mission. And then we'll talk a little bit about some other uses of, of time series data. So that's the that's the big the big picture overview of what's going to happen here. To give some context to what we're going to do, I do want to talk a little bit about how exoplanets are discovered. And NASA has a really excellent summary of the five main techniques astronomers have used. There are clever, creative ways to do other things. This is the, uh, to use other methods that will discover exoplanets. This is not an exhaustive list, uh, but the, the five most common are transits, microlensing, astrometry, radial velocity measurements, and direct imaging. That's a lot to throw at you. Again, you should look at this page if you're curious. Uh, it's linked up here. But for this one, we'll be we'll be talking about the transit method because that's what the test the test mission does. Uh, it's optimized to look for planets by staring at a particular field of the sky. It's, it's actually an enormous uh, field of the sky. That's 24 by 96 degree field. Um, there's no degree sign there, but it, it is a degree field for 27 days. And this is a test segment. That's what uh, the test mission calls them. There's an incredible video showing how this works, which I've tried to embed uh, into this into this uh, notebook. So we'll see how well it works. Oh, it totally works. Great. Uh, I don't know if the sound is coming through, but I'm actually going to mute it anyway so I can talk over it. So this is the test mission. Um, it's got one camera that's 24 degrees square. Points at the sky, um, and there's actually four of these cameras in total, which makes this rather impressive <laughs> large field of view. Uh, and once it does one sector of 96, it it will then turn and step and look at the next sector. And the original plan for the mission uh, when it was launched in 2018 was to do the entire southern hemisphere, flip, and then to do the entire northern hemisphere. So it's an all sky survey. Uh, I, I also just find that video so cool. That's one of my favorite uh, visualizations for this mission. It's, it's really neat to see uh, how it steps between everything. And so because of this, it's really powerful, right? Test, test uh, is a very high precision mission that looks, across, that looks at the entire sky uh, and is really able to delve deep into these, into these uh, transient or, or repeating phenomena like transiting exoplanets, uh, and, and also other things um, there. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. I'll actually do it now. 
There are other things that you might want to use this data for. So people who study the stars themselves and how they change in brightness over time due to changes in stellar atmospheres or other sort of uh, or other stellar dynamics might also use test data because it can be helpful. Um, again, that high precision is really helpful uh, when you're talking about the brightness over time and, and trying to look for trends. I, I did say the word transients too, by virtue of being an all sky survey. If a supernova goes off, sometimes it just happens to be in the test field of view, right? It's a pretty big field of view. So the odds actually aren't, aren't too bad that you'll find something. And there's a couple of examples of, of supernovae that have been discovered by tests. We're going to focus on the transit, though. Uh, this graphic is, is really great. And I, I think it does a good job of, of showing you all of these different views of what's going on. So you have this top-down view of the planet going around its star. You have this line of sight view. And when the planet passes in front of the star, you get this brightness dip. You see this pixel uh, that dims in brightness, and it kind of ties all of these concepts together. You know, what is the mission actually doing by by staring at these stars and waiting for these, uh, you know, lucky encounters where the planet happens to pass right in front of it? Um, we're able to detect exoplanets because we can see this this change in brightness, and that's that's sort of the most obvious way to do it. But you actually can you can see it in this pixel. Um, it'll dim, and then it'll get brighter. Um, so that's the that's the basic approach. That's what a transit is. We 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 wait and we hope that we get lucky and that the star will pass in front of our uh, that excuse me, planet will pass in front of its host star relative to our line of sight. So with with that background out of the way, I'm gonna dive right into this first example. Um, and I will take a couple of pauses for questions, but I, I want to get started on this one and then we'll um, we'll take a minute to discuss it. Our example target that we're going to use is WASP-153b. Uh, it's a known exoplanet. It's a gas giant around a G-type star. It's a little less than half of a Jupiter mass. And importantly, it only takes 3.3 days to complete an orbit, which is perfect because TESS looks at one sector for 27 days, so we have a chance to see multiple transits with this target, and it falls in the test, uh, and it falls into the test detectors. To do our analysis, we will need to import a couple of packages. I talked more about these last time, but the important ones are S3FS, which will let us open up uh, files in the cloud as though they're local, and this uh, astroperiodic observations, which is what we'll use to query the the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes MAST, which contains the data from tests. There's also two cells we or excuse me, two lines that we need to run to enable this. Uh, this this observations that enable cloud data set will let us query cloud data when it's possible. Um, and this S3FS thing is setting up uh, the system to read in to read in cloud data as though it were local. All right. With with the intro uh, imports out of the way, let's actually start with our query. So we already know our target, WASP 153. We are going to need to add some additional filters to narrow things down because uh, that matches a lot of things in the master archive. So what we'll do is we'll say test table is observations dot query. Um, also pro tip for people who don't know this because I didn't know this. If you hit tab while you're typing, uh, Jupiter will auto complete for you. It's a huge, huge time saver. It's, it's really great uh, and it avoids those pesky little typos that we have to go back to fix. We're going to use query criteria. Our object name is WASP153. This OBS collection parameter that I'm setting uh, is the idea of mission. So test is a, just a mission. Data product uh, w type is time series. We'll talk a, in a, a little bit in a second about why we're uh, excluding or why we're using that filter. And then sequence number, uh, this is the idea of a test sector. I'm setting it equal to 40. Uh, the, the sequence number, it's arbitrary. You could pick any test sector. I just did this to help narrow results. The same actually goes for time series data as well. We want to eliminate full frame images from our results. There's like there's going to be thousands of them per sector, and it really just clogs up the table, and we don't need to worry about it. We're not going to be using the full frame image. So our test table will be the observations we get back. 
uh, data products is observation dot get product list. We'll pass it our table of observations. Yes, table. Also, for anyone who wasn't here last week, this query process that I'm going through right now, uh, we, we did cover very much in detail last week. So if, uh, if you weren't able to attend, the recording is offline, uh, is is online, it's available on YouTube. I would recommend that you uh, go go watch that if you are unfamiliar with this process. Because I'm, I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail about this today. Uh, once we have the products, we're going to filter to just keep the science products. So I'll do that with the filter products, pass in data products that we already have, and keep only product type of science. And we will display some columns from the filter results. So that query will, will go out and it'll take a second. When it does, we should get three results, uh, and I'll talk about them as though they're here while this query is ready. Okay. We're going to get a data validation time series, which is a product that's produced by the test mission as part of their automated uh, exoplanet detection routine. It's not super relevant for us in this case because we're we're going to delve into some nitty gritty details, but it is there, um, and uh, people do do use it. It is a very useful product. The other things that we'll see are, are a, a like her file, which I talked about, and a, a TPF, a, a target pixel file. The target pixel file is what we're going to use in this notebook to do, to do interesting science. It is, here they go, yay, it came back. The target pixel file, if you think about that big 24 by 96 field of view, the target pixel file is like a little postage stamp. It's like a small, tiny, uh, in this case, it's actually, it's an 11, 11 pixel by 11 pixels. So it's really small uh, image of our target star. So per sector test chooses about 20,000 ish. It's, it's actually changed. They have a different system for it now, but they choose N, a number of targets to observe at, at, at a high cadence and they create these postage stamps for them. They, it would be great to do this with the whole sky, but that would eat up all of the available memory on board the spacecraft. So we can't do that. They have to. They have to be selected by what they pick. All right. So back to the back to the products. We've got the data validation time series, light curves, target pixel file. We're gonna prepare to open both of them, the light curve and the target pixel file. We actually are only. Um, we're only going to use the target pixel file for the moment, but it's since we're already here, we'll do both of them. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, oops, not else not, sorry, I'll see. We're going to get the URI, Uniform Resource Indicator, uh, which will let us open the cloud file, and we'll use the get cloud URIs function, and we will pass in LC. Broad. Oh no, I'm, I'm sorry. I should be, I should be filtering. Sorry, folks. Uh, we are not. I don't actually have the product. Uh, what I have here is this this table. So if I pass it filtered, I'm not going to get what I want. I need to do one more filtering step, even though we've already filtered. Uh, observation stop. Filter products. I also am going to rename this to P R O D L C products. Oh, sorry. I just confused people. We need to we need to take our uh, data products and we need to filter it down um, further to just to just the result that we want. So we'll take uh, we will take data products. Uh, actually, let's do filter. Why not? Filtered, and we're going to use product sub. Description. This is a very uh, verbose tag equals LC. And again, that's just right. That's this up here. This is LC. You could also type description equals like curves. That would that would do the same thing. Our pixel product is observation stop filter products. Product sub group. Description equals TP. 
And I will go ahead and run that. So all this has done is filter this down from three to one in each case. We, you, know, you could do it by indexing, but it's better to, to filter instead of saying, oh, the LC product is the first result or the Python indexing bracket one uh, result. It's, we should be explicit because this order that it comes back in isn't, isn't guaranteed. Okay, we have the products, which actually I'm just going to display so it's it's clear. So target pixel product is one one row, one one file, and that's what we need to to use to, to do the science. Uh, to actually do that, we're going to convert those into URIs. So this is where I was getting ahead of myself earlier. Observations don't get cloud URIs. We'll pass in the LC products. We're just doing that so we have it for later. Uh, we're not going to use it right away. Okay. This one, do the same thing. So, product, and we'll print it out to make sure that it makes sense. Great. Okay. We got it back. It's, it's in the, uh, the S3, which is our general storage bucket, ST public data, test public, and then there's a long string of things uh, that, that signify what it is. This tells me it's in sector 40, so it looks like we've, we've probably got the, the right observation. We haven't made uh, some silly mistake along the way. To handle the target pixel file, uh, there's one more one more thing that we have to do um, to, to open it. I, again, I covered this syntax last time, so if you didn't see it, you can always go back and watch the recording. But what we're going to do is use fs.open. We're going to pass in the target pixel URI read it in as a binary file, and then we can use fits.open uh, to, to do the rest of the work. So it's a file, open it in this h list, and let's let's see what's in here. Let's let's take a look at what we're working with. So what we have, uh, there are two, two interesting uh, HDUs in here. One is pixels, and one is aperture. The pixels contains the images, the actual 11 by 11 image that, that shows brightness for each of them. And the aperture gives us information about how the image was processed. We're gonna, we're gonna start with the aperture, uh, but we will read in all of the data now so that we have it available. Uh, to save a little bit of time, I'm actually just gonna copy these first two lines because they are getting recycled. And we'll do pixels equals hdu list one again hdu list one because number one is pixels dot data aperture equals hdu list two because aperture is number two dot data excellent and you may have noticed my memory usage just jumped down here it's because i have read that data out of the file and I've stored it into the computer's memory, into the pixels and aperture variables. So it's it's now available uh, in, in the memory. I didn't even have to, I didn't have to download anything, right? Nothing has showed up in this directory. It's just uh, available. All right. So like I said, we're going to take a look at the aperture first. Uh, I'm going to, to do a demo of how to, to set up this plot once and the rest of the time I, I, I left it filled in. So to get started, we're going to set up our figure and axis. Um, this is using matplotlib, and so I'll do plot dot subplots. We're going to display the pixels as an image. So we'll do axis dot in show in show. We're going to feed it in the data from aperture. Uh, this origin equals lower is just so that the origin is in the lower left. So it's at zero, zero, how you expect the coordinate system to look. You don't have to do that, but your axes will be backwards if you don't. We're going to add a color bar. Make your dot color bar. Passing in uh, that, that object. And we'll add some titles. So figure, title, uh, wasp, uh, one. I think in my notes I have to say uh, 53, but 153. Okay, if you're if you're following along in the uh, other version, it says 53. It's it's wasp 153. Aperture uh, sector sector 40. 
and I put the quotation marks in our show. Great. Ta da! Um, hmm. This, this doesn't look much like a star, does it? This doesn't look like an image taken by a telescope. So, what is the aperture? What is going on here? Uh, I will give you the answers to this, but it is time for our interactive exercise. And I want to narrow the focus because what's going on here is, is a pretty broad question. Uh, so the, the actual things to investigate are one, how many distinct values are used in this image? Uh, and the color mapping sort of gives you a hint to that, but you might want to check more thoroughly. Question two, which you will have to check more thoroughly, what are the distinct values being plotted? Again, in this aperture image, uh, it, it's an array, uh, it's an 11 by 11 array, and each one of those values, each one of these pixels, uh, it, it has a value. I want to know what those values are. So how many unique values are there and what are those unique values? And then question three, this is kind of a bonus. It's just if you have time, uh, you can do this advanced one. I'm not expecting everyone to do it. Uh, the integer being displayed for these things is part of a nine digit binary number. If you visit this link on the test archive manuals chapter on data products, but specifically the aperture mask image flags table, uh, it, it'll tell you what these values mean. So you could try to figure out what these values correspond to. Uh, you've got an answer cell here. There are some hints uh, for one and two. There's a, num a NumPy function that will get you there in one line. Uh, and for three, if you do get there, you can use the numpy.binary representation function uh, to, to convert between those two things. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take five-ish minutes to do this. So let's call that uh, 34 by the time I'm done talking. 34 past the hour. I have put a little hint if you're stuck uh, on the on the screen. All right. Uh, apologies if you're still working on this. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, for putting your hands up. Um, I'm gonna go through the answer just so that we have time to cover the material. So the the, the solution here. Uh, well, first of all, you could just type aperture as I've done, right? And look at this array and then kind of try to figure out what numbers you're seeing. Uh, but there is a NumPy function that will get you here in one line. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with NumPy, it's great. Uh, it, it brings a lot of uh, functionality to, to Python from um, and it, in a way that sort of emulates uh, the program to see. Uh, but the function in this case is np.unique. And if we pass in our uh, aperture, to that, it will just give us the unique results, 257, 261, 267. So we can answer that in one fell swoop. There are three distinct values. Our eyes were not deceiving us. These colors are the same. Uh, and their values are, are 251, 261, and 267. Uh, you can use uh, np.binary representation. Uh, let's just pass in 257. And that will convert this to a binary digit, and this is what we get. So what those numbers represent, uh, I'll actually click on this link and take us to this chapter of the archive manual, is this table, uh, ooh, zooming in did not quite do what I wanted it to do. And this table here, so given the binary digit, uh, one through nine, if the value is set, it tells you that whatever that is in the description is true. So in our case here, I'm gonna flip back and forth for just one second. We have the first, and, and last bits have been set. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the pixel was collected by the spacecraft. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> that makes sense. And then the last one, the the, the largest value, is uh, is also set. So that tells us that the pixel that the pixel is on CCD output D, um, as opposed to A, B, or C. This pixel, as a matter of fact, is uh, one of the background. One of these purple pixels that isn't being used for anything. Uh, this yellow region in the center, if we were to do this same exercise and, and look at what the, the bit flags are, it would tell us that this is used as the optimal aperture. And then this sort of teal color is part of the, the background. So it's used to figure out, um, it's used to help correct for effects from uh, stray light within these, within these uh, 11 by 11 pixels. That's the solution. Um, 
this in, there's more information down here about exactly uh, what those things correspond to, but uh, I think in the interest of time, we'll go we'll go right into to talking about how we actually handle this stuff now that we know where the optimal aperture, as decided by the mission, is. Generally, you can trust this. It's a pretty it's a pretty robust process using uh, the cross matching with Gaia to figure out where stars are and then setting up a brightness threshold around it to just pick out that star. Um, and, and so we we are going to want to keep keep this in mind. However, uh, we are going to go ahead and, and move on to actually handling some of the data in the in the pixels uh, pixels column. So the the pixel data. Uh, let's see what's in it. There's it's a more complicated data structure. It's not a single eleven by eleven image. It's actually got multiple columns, including uh, notably time, and also flux. Those are the two ingredients for a time series plot. So that's what we need to extract out of here. To figure to learn more about the other columns, uh, you should click on this link to the science data products description. Some of these things are kind of technical. I think things like flux error, E R R error, sort of makes sense that that would be the flux error. But there are other things in here too uh, that you you might want to use. So I'm going to grab this data. Pixels. I'm going to grab the fluxes. So flux, again, just using the keywords from above. And also I'm going to use uh, numpy shape uh, and pass in uh, the, the fluxes just to, just to see what the, what the shape is. Um, so in this case, the shape of the flux is 20,309. I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to say 20,000. 20,000 by 11 by 11. Now, 11 by 11 was our aperture. That's the image. We have 20,000 of them. So if you like to visualize things, you could imagine taking a photo and then stacking another one on top of it, and then taking another photo a couple seconds later and stacking it on top of it. And so it, it, it stacks that image as it goes through time, if you're a fan of three-dimensional plots. Um, we're not going to plot this three-dimensional. We're, we're actually just going to take a look at the first image. To get the first image, we need to do some, some Python indexing. Uh, so if we're thinking about the shape, the first image would be the flux. There's 20,000 of them. So I want the first one, which in Python, we, you would specify with a zero. I'm gonna do comma. This colon means give me every, every uh, give me the full length of this dimension. And I'm going to do this colon as well to specify, give me the full length of this dimension. So we're getting all of the 11 by 11, but we're only getting the very first one of these 20,000 images. And then all of this code below is just taking this first and turning it into a plot. Um, I, we, we type something very similar about the flux is not defined. Indeed, it's not because I called it fluxes. Okay, here we go. Ta-da! This is, this is a real image. Uh, now you might be thinking to yourself, this is not a very impressive image, and indeed it's it's not. It's an 11 by 11 image of the star. It's it's not a beautiful high resolution Hubble photo, uh, but that's the price we pay for having a 24 by 96 degree field of view. It's it's things on the detectors are very spread out. Uh, what you're actually seeing when we're talking about brightness is electrons per second that fell onto this detector. Uh, the test does not calibrate anything to physical units. You're working in electrons per second. Now, to actually, and apologies that I'm not pausing for questions, I do see what the time is, so I know that we kind of have to keep moving if we want to get to the end. Um, I'll try to pause there, but if there's something that you don't understand, again, please do put it in the, the Slack chat or the WebEx chat. Uh, to, to actually get to our light curve, we need to figure out a way to add up the brightnesses. Well, how are we going to do that? Uh, actually, we, we already have the solution. Um, we, we know what the optimal aperture is. I'm going to scroll up for just one second here. Uh, it's this. It's this shape here in yellow. And if you look at our image, indeed, that does more or less correspond to the star, right? You could make an argument that you should include some of these pixels here on the side, but uh, generally the test mission does a pretty good job of deciding what you actually need to include or not. Um, with these central pixels, we'll have more than enough information uh, to, to create a light curve here. So what we'll do is we'll take one image at a time, We'll add up all the brightnesses of these pixels, and that'll give us that bright the brightness at that moment when the when the picture was taken, 
and, and convert it into just a number, which is what we'll need for our time series plot of a flux versus time. It's a it's a little tricky uh, to actually do this. In general, we should figure it out by figuring uh, by determining which pixels have the optimal aperture bit set, and it has a value of two. Uh, to parse that correctly, you have to convert all of the pixels in the image uh, into their binary representations, and then figure out where that that one flag is set. You can do it; it's not that hard, uh, but it does take a second to type out that function and to think through it. So that's not what we're doing; we're cheating because we know that the optimal aperture has a value of 267. Caution, this is going to fail 75% of the time. And why 75% of the time? Because 25% of the time it's going to fall on output D. 75% of the time it's not going to. Uh, so this is a hack. This is a hack for this session. Do not do this if you are actually trying to, to manually do something like this. This is not the right way, but it is fast and it does work. Uh, so we'll say that the optimal aperture is uh, where the aperture equals 267. This might look a little weird, uh, and I'm going to plot it just so that we can make sure that I've done it right. Basically, uh, we've, we've told it to, to give me the optimal aperture where aperture equals 267. Um, you'll notice I use two equal signs here, which uh, is not the same as an assignment equal sign when you only use one of them. This asks the question, where is this true? This does a, a variable assignment. Let's set up, oops, rotation mark blow up. Uh, let's set up our plot just to make sure. And great, it makes sense. We're, we're seeing, uh, we're actually seeing trues and falses. And you know what? I, I do want to print this out just because it's interesting to see. Optimal. Uh, so you have an array where it says false, 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 false. And then there's a couple sections of true. Uh, and you can actually almost see the shape just in the words here. Uh, this this is the, the aperture. And we can use this. To uh, to index to slice our our images by saying give me this image and passing all those trues and falses it will only keep the values where the pixels are labeled as true so that will let us add up all the flux from one particular spot uh, as mentioned previously NumPy is a wonderful library and it's going to make this summation very easy for us um, we we do have to do a, a little bit of slicing on our own first. So the flux sum is equal to numpy uh, nan sum I'm using. This is another reason we're using numpy because I wanted to ignore all of the not a number values. Some of these uh, do end up in test data just as a result of processing. So nan sum of the flux, I want all of the images. That's what this colon is giving me, but only in the section where the optimal aperture exists. So again, that's going to give us just this slice of the image. Adding this axis equals one parameter tells NumPy, please do not add up all of the numbers I'm giving you into one final result. It says, please add them up on an image-wise basis. That's by specifying the axis, that's what we're doing. Uh, and we can actually check that by doing length of flux sum. And when I run this, uh, once again, it's fluxes, uh, not, not just flux. And when I run this, uh, we get back that it is a it is an array that is 20,000 values long. So we've done it correctly. It has collapsed each one of the images into a single numeric value that represents brightness. Okay, great. That is that is all the hard work we've done. We've done it all. We can make a plot. Uh, just to make things a little easier to see, we are going to normalize it. So the median flux is numpy man median. Uh, the flux sum. Uh, we're going to normalize by dividing the flux sum by the median flux. Uh, and that'll just, it'll give us a nice even value of one so it's easier to see uh, things that happen in the data. And to that, uh, I, I do want to just point out how cool this is. We have found, we, we can see the planet. Those regularly spaced dips that we're seeing, that is the characteristic signal uh, of, of, the, of an exoplanet, it, that regular spacing. Um, and if you zoom in, you'll actually be able to see that more of that shape. Um, it's only because we've got so much data here that the, the points are crowded together. So 
uh, very quickly, because I see we're running out of time, I do want to point out the fact that all of this work that we've done, it's not for nothing, but the test pipeline has actually already done it for us. Now, if you're thinking, oh, why did I just sit through this webinar? Uh, it's sort of the same reason why we teach people how to add and multiply, even though calculators exist. It's great, it's convenient, but you kind of have to know what's going on behind the scenes if you want to continue uh, stepping up or, or really just to be able to, to handle handle the data uh, responsibly and, and know what's going on. We're going to return to our LC files that I discussed earlier. Uh, and I'll type that in here. So it's LC where I zero. Uh, and we're going to print out the HTTP list using HTTP list info. All right, this is what's in the, the, LC, the light curve file, the LC file. Um, there's a light curve and aperture bin um, header data unit. The light curve is the one that has the data that we want. The aperture is identical to the aperture from before. So let's actually read the data out. LC zero, I zero. and we want uh, we're going to actually, there's one thing we have to do. Print HDU list one dot columns and SAP flux. Uh, this, this will make sense once we print out those columns. You'll just have to trust me for a second here. HDU list one dot data SAP flux. Uh, PDC sat flux one data flux. All right, uh, close that correctly. So this is all of the data, the the columns that are located that are in this light curve uh, header data unit. Time. Uh, there's SAP flux and PDC SAP flux. Uh, there's other things in here as well. You can go back to that reference that we talked about earlier to figure out what each one means. But I wanna very quickly explain SAP, simple aperture photometry, PDC, free search data conditioning. Simple aperture photometry is what we just did. That is, here's an aperture, sum up all the flux, create the light curve. PDC is a little bit more complicated. It looks across the entire uh, CCD, the entire uh, field of view for that for that particular uh, detector. And then it looks for trends that are in common among the brighter stars on the plane, uh, the, within the field of view, that is. So, for, exa if, for example, if you see a pattern in both stars of, you know, suddenly becoming brighter after TESS resumes, uh, resumes operation after transmitting science data, and then it kind of dims over time, Chances are, if they're far enough apart, that's probably a detector effect, scattered light, thermal setup, you know, there, there could be many things that could be. And so we're removing, they remove systematics uh, in, a, in a very careful way. It does occasionally remove real uh, astrophysical signals, so you have to be careful, and sometimes you just have to go back to the target pixel files, but it's, um, it's generally pretty nice. I have no more code typing. I'm just going to plot things um, because I anticipated that we would be crunched for time here. So the plot that I'm generating now is the, uh, it's a copy of this plot. So I'm just, it's exactly the same thing, just I didn't want to have to scroll. With, I've added in um, the SAP, the simple aperture photometry flux from the mission. And then I've also, I've normalized it just so we are comparing apples to apples. And if you take a look at that, those are, uh, to my eye, identical. So our simple aperture photometry and Tessa's simple aperture photometry give more or less the same result, uh, which is good. So, so it means we want to understand what the mission is doing and that too, we didn't do it incorrectly. Uh, they are nearly identical. There's actually, they're actually not totally the same, uh, but there's an optional exercise at the end if you're really curious about this. And the last thing I want to point out is the PDC SAP. Uh, the preconditioned data, and again, by detrending anything that's common between all of the stars on the CCD, we can remove systematics. And I wanted to create a plot of this one just to show you some of the differences. So, first of all, what a beautiful plot! I mean, this is just great. You can, it's so, so clear what's going on here. Those transits are extremely, extremely obvious, and I do encourage uh, you to, to uh, 
play around with this and, and zoom in and maybe look at this region because you really will be able to see this characteristic dip. Again, it's this regular intervals of going down. This is what a transit looks like. Um, it's it's a really a great example. The, the thing I want to point out, though, is that you should notice that overall, it's very flat. So if I scroll up and compare with this, uh, you see that there's kind of this sort of downward slope uh, on the on the right half of the data here. And, you know, it's a little bit less noticeable, but there's something similar kind of goes down and then it sort of goes back up and then down a little bit again. Uh, that's that's not actual uh, signal coming from this star. That is that is more than likely just noise or instrumental effects or something else. And so it would be common to all of the stars in this detector. And so by using the PDC sap, you get this really, really clean, beautiful light curve. And so it's probably what you would actually use if you were doing the science yourself. But again, it's good to understand where this data comes from so that you know when and how to use it for your own research. All right, that is all that we're going to cover today. Um, next time on Fast Summer Webinar, we're going to be talking about other uses of test time series data. We're going to delve into processing interesting signals from, from noise and, and things that aren't exoplanets. Uh, and just as a as a preview for those of you who are curious, uh, the optional exercise looks at the fact that if you subtract these two graphs, so if you take these first values, our calculated ones, and you subtract the SAP flux, you would expect the difference to be zero, because these look the same, right? They're, they're my eye says they're identical. Um, but if you actually plot them, they're not the same. There, there is a very small difference between the two of them, and it's actually quite interesting how it gets here. Uh, we don't have the time to talk about it, but if you're curious, I do encourage you to look into this exercise because it is it is interesting. And I uh, actually ran into this issue myself while, while doing some of my own science, and I I did spend a couple of, of, of hours delving into this, but I hope that my hints down, down below in this plot will give you a good head start. Thank you all for coming. I hope that I will see you at the next webinar uh, on Tuesday at, at the same time. And uh, I will I will leave it all. I will leave it there for today.